Your phone name. Sam, if you're... Sam. Okay. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, it's a huge honor to be asked to facilitate discussion uh, tonight for the first step of a documentary that is going to be based on your guys' experience with uh, Carlisle and bringing home uh, the nine relatives from Carlisle. But before we start, this is such a huge topic and has been for all of you. I want to ask one of you to do the to do go check in. Josh. The prayer is what we do. Um, to Gosh, I, I want to thank you for bringing everyone here today. I want to thank you for giving everyone good health and good fortune as everyone is going through a good part in their lives. I want to thank, you know, Lawrence for taking the time out of his day for coming, keeping everyone healthy. You know, to Gosh, I want you to keep those that are sick, those that are ill. Those that are going through a hard time right now, I want you to watch over them and give them extra strength and guidance as they need it. And to Kasha, I want you to look over our elders as, you know, the weather gets nice and hopefully as everything comes to life, you know, it uplifts everyone, especially our elders. Um, to Kasha, I just want you to keep everyone, you know, in your, in your faith and in your trust as you lead us you know, into a new phase in our lives and through this new step of, you know, letting our story be known to more people, more than just our people, to those that are gaining interest into what's going on, the action that's being taken among our tribal nations. Mm. Chagasha, I just want you to, you know, make sure everyone is healthy and that everyone keeps the big, big picture in their sights. Um, Thank you, sir. Thank you. So before we begin the discussion, I just want to talk real briefly about how this all began. Uh, so back in 2015, I worked with an amazing team at the Defending Childhood Initiative. It was uh, myself, Sunrise Platform, Marcella Medicine Blanket, Michael Lunderman, and Tori Whipple. And we provided services to children who were exposed to violence and trauma. And it, we also did a lot of collaborative work with the Tokala Ignacio. At that time, they were a suicide prevention mentoring program, and they were led by Jessica Tuigal and her staff. It was during that time that we decided that, you know, we wanted to take a different approach to providing services, and so what we did was um, it was decided that we would develop or, or bring back to life the Sichuan Youth Council. Sichuan Youth Council was developed in 1990, 1991. So from that time to when you all came to be as a council, there was really nothing offered in terms of leadership in that capacity. And so it was a huge honor to, to develop this. Um, at that time, uh, Sunrise, decided that you know we should provide a lot of leadership opportunities and so she thought it would be a good idea to take you all to the unity conference if you all remember at um washington dc mm -hmm. and also during that time i had shared how my parents were really into carlisle we were actually trying to take my mom to carlisle that summer and um, Sunrise had overheard that conversation, so she thought, why don't we just stop at Carlisle on our way back from D.C.? And that is how it all started. Mm -hmm. And so from here, I'm turning it all, all over to you all. I want you guys to share your experiences, your hopes and dreams about, you know, moving forward and, you know, just basically what you hope happens. I know we still have some relatives that are over there. What are your thoughts about that? Uh, what this whole movement has done for you all? So to start us off, I just want you all to, to introduce yourself, uh, tell us where you're from, 
and how life has been growing up on the reservation. Um, so I guess I'll go first. Um, my name is Joshua Ironshell. I'm 22 years old. Uh, I come from the Hedog community, which is more of the, you know, western part of the reservation, of the Rosebud Reservation. Um, I mean, how is life? I mean, it's all, everything that, you know, goes on in the life on the reservation is kind of what we consider normal. I know it may be seen as a, uh, I mean, lower socioeconomic status along with everything like that. It may be hard for some people outside that don't live on the reservation to come to terms on how we, what we consider normal and how we make use of what we're given. But, uh, I mean, I live the life, you know, filled with love and compassion. It's all I could ever ask for, especially for the, you know, difficulties that I've experienced on my life here. And, you know, I was able to find success um, on the reservation and off the reservation, and I'm able to come back and be in a position where I can, you know, help uh, the youth, where I can help my peers. And I mean, that's all I could really ask for as of now in my life. And I'm really grateful for what I have going on in it. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Brooke Espinoza. Um, I am 22 years old from the Rosewood community. Um, life on the reservation, I feel like. For many people, like Josh said, you know, regardless of the disparities here on like where we live, it's what you make it. It can either be really bad or it can be really good. But I feel like for myself, I've found it to be like a beautiful place and somewhere that I'm proud to be from. Uh, being a young mother living on the reservation um, has taught me so much already. Just like wanting to be successful, not only for myself, but for my child and for his future as well. Madaka pi lakomi charge ki wamli hakewe na um wasitu mi charge ki richer janisa machapi na ukjemana nukla sama yamani na um suchanga makoche mataha na hepeji o yanke o tie na wakanji ki toke chi wawashe chang na sente glashka university ekta um awawawa. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Rachel Janice. My Lakota name is Wambli Hakewi, which translates to Last Day of a Woman. Um, growing up on the reservation, I was very much sheltered. But when I stepped outside my house and I went into the went to school, I saw how hard life really was on the reservation. Saw the, all the hardships, the violence, the addictions that our people face, and being a youth. Living on the reservation, um, it was really, really hard um, because I, I had friends who I couldn't help and I wish that I could. I had relatives who were fighting battles that I wish I knew how to help them through, get through. Um, uh, growing up, I tried everything to be a part of so many things so that way I can utilize them for the future. Um, for the people and for the unborn gen for the next generations. That that's that's what my life is growing up on the reservation. Um hello, my name is Mallory Arrow. I am twenty four years old. I am a mother to two boys. Um, I've been in the Tokala Inagio suicide prevention program since twenty twelve. Um, growing up on the reservation for me, I've never um, really felt like I was poor or really never really noticed like the people around me are poor. I think I grew up really privileged um, to be in a household where um, there was a lot of love and yeah, I don't know. My name is Callie Olson. Um, I'm 19 years old and I'm from the Parmalee community. Um, I agree with what Brooke and Rachel said that the res can be a beautiful place and I am also proud of where I come from. Um, I was the youngest in this youth group, so I kind of grew up around these people and I feel like I've succeeded a lot in my life just because of who I looked up to. Um, and 
yeah, I just, um, I currently go to Mitchell Tech um, and I plan on going into nursing and coming back and doing a lot for my community. Hi, my name is Carly Olson. I'm from the Parmalee community. Um, <clears throat> life on the res um, growing up was hard. I, I too went to Mitchell Tech and I did graduate in 2019. And from going to school off the res made me realize that um, living on the reservation wasn't too bad just because my family's here, my, fa my friends are here, and I made a life for myself, and it just made me more motivated to come back to the reservation and be there for my people and my community, just because I know we we went through a lot and I just learned to love being on the reservation. Thank you. I, I just wanted to say that we have six of you here and it's really good to see you all here. Originally, you all started out with 29. It was 29 of you that traveled to DC and then to Colorado. And then over the years, several, <coughs> many others actually have joined. I even lost count of how many all together. But so I'm really glad. I know everyone's, almost everyone is in, well, everyone is an adult now. Um, <laughs> that looks youngish. So everyone just kind of has their own lives now. So I, I really do appreciate you all coming. Um, so like I said earlier, um, this, this whole movement, everything started in 2015. Um, and when we finally brought the relatives home, that was in 2021. So it was said many times that it took our tribe six years to finally bring our relatives home from Carlisle. Why do you think it took so long? And what would you do differently the next time you all go somewhere to bring relatives home? Do I start again? Um, um, just whoever. I think it's like a popcorn. Oh, okay. Um, well, I kind of, I think I, I could answer the first part of what would you, or why do you think it took so long? And I think a lot of that, I think like the time length it took was because of uh, kind of establishing the relationship, not like with the tribe and like with the government and everything with that. Um, it was something that, you know, wasn't particularly, you know, useful or I want to say that uh, it wasn't really commonly used as much as you would think with the with our own tribal governing body and stuff but um i like to think it was the whole time it took was to establish that relationship and being able to use those connections so like hopefully in the future along with this process that you know things happen a lot more quickly um yeah i think um the reason, well, personally, I think the reason why it took so long was that this is the first time this had ever happened, mm -hmm. at least for our tribe. And I think the first year um, we talked about it, and then, or well, yeah, 2016 we met with the government, or the we had the government to government meeting, and we were able to sit in the same room with these officials who had the say, like the say, the say to like whether or not we were able to bring our relatives home. But I think the first couple of years, like we had to really pri like tell them like we we want to bring them home, um, applying that pressure. Um, we went through a lot of loopholes, and I think after so long they were like, okay, you know, now we know how serious they are about this. This isn't just an idea that they created when they were 15, 16 years old. This is something that they they worked really hard on, and they're working really hard on bringing home. Um, I had something else to say. Anybody else want to share? 
why you think it took so long? I think what you should be done differently next time. I think what should be done differently next time is that um, mm, on the our situation was that they said that we can bring them home. Then they went back on that. I feel like um, now what we can do differently is that if they say yes, then we keep applying that pressure. We keep telling, you know, demanding that hey, this is what you said. Let's not come back on that. Um, this is what you promised. And, you know, like, let's work together to bring them home and not have to create problems. Um, but yeah, that's something that I would think that we could work differently on is just applying that pressure. I just want to like add something. I mean, now that we've did it once, I like to be like have like that hopeful thinking, the optimism that like going forward that like they'll be more lenient towards like cooperating with us since we already did it once, mm -hmm. you know. Because another governing body was able to work with us, you know, another one moving forward in the future should be able to cooperate with us. Um, so, I mean, that's just the optimism in me thinking that, you know, it should be more smooth, hopefully, mm -hmm. moving forward. And also, we're not the only ones no more. There's other tribes that are bringing their relatives home. And so, the next time, it'll be much easier, I mean, I would hope, mm -hmm. because we have this, like, group of people, like, nations standing beside us, behind us, beside us. And next time, I think it'll be more easier because we have this support. Along with like the recognition from, you know, the White House and, you know, to the national government too. You know, uh, Deb Holland's, you know, tour across the nation, you know, is bringing recognition to the topic. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, I know some of you talked just a little bit about, you know, what you've been doing um, since, two, since July uh, 2021. But I would want to know, uh, what you all have been doing in regards to boarding schools, um, you know, repatriation boarding schools, not just Carlisle, but others. Mm -hmm. uh, if you can share a little bit about your work. I know a lot of you have, have done some public speaking. You've been invited to speak. Some of you in your work, you have been doing some stuff, so if you can share all of that. Mm -hmm. Um, well, um, I know as far as uh, Fort Ogala, um, we've been doing like continuous research, um, not only on like, you know, our boarding schools here, but just um, all over. And we're taking that information and pushing it out to all the communities and making sure everyone is knowledgeable of what's going on now. Uh, we've been, since uh, I worked at Ogala last year, and during my time there, we were invited out to Oak, uh, Crow Creek to talk with their their people about what steps they, we took um, to repatriate our relatives. And we were even reached out by the International Indigenous Youth Council Oglala chapter on what steps we took. So I think during my time at Ogala, we, we, we did outreach. Um, we, we networked with other tribes to talk with because like, they, they have a really good, a high interest in bringing or repatriating their relatives from somewhere else, another cemetery, or even starting um, their own boarding school investigation where, where they're, um, if there was a, a, a residential boarding school in, that, in their area. Um, and we have been researching, like Brick said. Um, we started researching in the fall of 2021 after we brought home our relatives um, and it was a research that still kept going even when I left but um, um, I'm not sure how many binders there is but when Deb Holland came in October of last in 2022 we were able to like showcase all that um, the boarding schools that are in South Dakota. Um, and also as like individuals, we, I mean, I can't really speak for everyone, but we, 
I have been invited to talk about Carlisle repatriation journey. Um, and I'm, that's the same for everyone here too, is that we've been invited to places, um, we've traveled to places, um, trying to get the, to spread out the, the, the message, the word, um, not so much about our story, but what we can do to help others in their repatriation journey or their process of knowing what steps to take um, on the legal aspect as well. I know that a lot of uh, a lot of other tribes have reached out to you all. I know most recently the Sisseton Wapitan tribe. They're going to be repatriating two of their relatives, and I know you all have. Um, I don't know if you all made that journey up there. You were, there was a storm or something, but they have always been inclusive to the Rosebud youth, as they refer you all to. Every time that they have a, a you know, public announcements and updates on their repatriation journey, but they always acknowledge the Rosebud Sioux mm -hmm. tribe for starting on everything, starting starting your movement, sharing. You all acknowledged um, Amos LaFromboy, who mm -hmm. was the first, um, first uh, Sioux, is what we referred to who passed away. So, I just want to acknowledge you all for that. Okay, so what stood out to you all during the trip to Carlisle and bringing the relatives home in July 2021? What did you take from that whole entire process from leaving here, from going to Whetstone, mm -hmm. making prayers to making the journey there and all of the tribes of people along the way that reached out mm -hmm. to actually being there? Um, you all standing up there by them, that was such a powerful, powerful moment, even for us who were standing you know, in the crowd. Mm -hmm. Clear to coming back. What was that experience like for all for all of you? Mm -hmm. Um so I didn't go the first time, but um I was very honored to get asked to go um, to bring them back and making that journey down there was um, very overwhelming just because it's it's a long drive and everything but um, working like the six years that to bring back the kids was um, a long journey but when we were down there it was just really, really overwhelming and every time I wanted to, I mean, every time we were down there I just wanted to cry just because that was my first time being down there and um, I can talk all about the journey coming home because I didn't know that we made that much of an impact, like people were doing candlelight visuals and um, my dad lives in North Dakota and he heard about it on the news and I didn't think it would be that known around the United States but it's just a very overwhelming experience and something I'm really proud to be a part of. Um, I'll go next. I think the biggest part for me was just like how in, like in unison everything was the entire trip like the trip to you know Carlisle all the way it was like what a two day drive and I mean it was a long journey for all of us like you know getting like literally like two to like no hours of sleep every night and I mean it was just like a crazy experience for all of us but I mean for me I mean I enjoyed that experience like from beginning to end and I say that with like a lot of gratitude in my heart and but when I say like in unison you know I'm talking about you know going there you know going through this like our process you know bringing the bodies back the remains and stuff back and then you know the biggest part for me was like 
when we're like on the road and like we would drive by like horses or like cattle and stuff like how they were like in movement with us like the birds like everything like it was just like the little things like on the trip that like you take note of and like has like the longest most, mean, most meaningful impact mm -hmm. like on you and you know just like you know like um they were saying you know the candlelight vigils and you know the communities that like fed us let us like you know rest during the day and like stuff like that i mean it was just one of the most like honorable and humbling experiences you could like ever have in this life and i'm gr grateful that i got to experience it you know not only for myself but you know with these group of you know amazing people you know the non-selfish reasons you know sacrificing our time our energy our effort and our thoughts you know to be with you know our ancestors and our relatives and I mean, it's just it's it's just a crazy experience all around, and I mean, it was a roller coaster of emotions, you know. For me, it took me a while, but like when it got to the tail end of things, like when I was realizing that they were actually coming back home, and I mean all that. That's when I. I don't like to think I'm an emotional person, but like you know, that was a time where I thought it was right to just let everything out, you know not only, you know, for joy and excitement, but, you know, for the sadness that, you know, had to be so long for them to finally come back. And, you know, the anger of, you know, them being removed from the first place. And I mean, just everything that goes in with that, you know, but, you know, all in all, I'm just grateful that I got to experience it, especially in this lifetime. Um. Well, the entire experience going to Carlisle and being in Carlisle was um, a very emotional experience, not just for myself, but for everyone here. Everyone in the room, everyone not in the room. Um, <clears throat> something I, I took away from the, it, from being in Carlisle was when we were doing the transfer ceremony and I made a connection when I was standing in front of um, um, Ernest Knoxhoff, or um, one of the relatives, and I was standing in front of um, his cedar box, and I was thinking about that time, and I was 16, 15 years old, and I was standing in front of the graves, and I was... Um, getting sad for them, um, a, a feeling that, you know, prior to coming to Carlisle the first time, I never really understood or never really knew about boarding schools, only just that Carlisle was the first implemented boarding schools for the, um, for Native children. And I made that connection, standing back in front of that, uh, Ernest's box and I, you know, and I, I was thinking of that journey of the six years that it took for them to come home and thinking, you know, my 15 year old self is happy um, because I, you know, it was a long six years, a very long six years, very <sighs> difficult um, six years for us. Um, and during the transfer ceremony, Seeing all these officials come and, you know, like talk on behalf of the Rosewood Sioux Tribe, on behalf of the Strong Youth Council, but us, like more importantly, the, the nine children we we're bringing home. I think uh, seeing how much this impacted not only our tribe, but Indian country seeing all the people standing on the side of the road, standing on, you know, holding signs, wearing orange, having signs, posters of the nine children in their names. And I, as an individual, I never realized just how, just how that in my lifetime, I never thought I would ever be a part of something so monumental something so historical and 
I, I really cherished every moment when we were in Carlisle and I thought of all the relatives who went to boarding schools, who never came home, who, who went missing, um, all the relatives who did come home and who were affected by their experience at boarding schools. I thought of my grandparents and I thought of my friends' grandparents. I thought of everyone and I thought, you know, I knew that this would probably really bring up some old, really bring up some wounds, but this was a step toward healing. And healing isn't linear, you know, some days you wake up and you're like, you think you have it all, you think you know it all, but some days you wake up and it, it like that pain, it, that, that trauma hurts. But what we did in 2015 leading up to 2021, it, it created a shift not only in our, in our tribe, but a shift in Indian country. And it created this movement that, you know, it, it, it's not, it's actually normal to, to, look, on, to look on like um, um, native news or, you know, and to see a tribe wanting to bring home their relatives. It's, we've normalized that and, and the topic of boarding school is starting to get normalized. Um, but as young ones, you know, we, we had to really go through um, understanding historical trauma and intergenerational trauma before we can even bring home these relatives. And so that's something I took home. I, something I took away from this journey is that is that um, that we we're not doing it for ourselves we're, we're doing it for for our, our families for our people and for you know to bring the the history of indigenous people to light so that way the US government don't forget about us um, and I'll always remember it just throughout the trip we we saw signs like fireflies in the field when we were going through um, back home and you know and fireflies actually symbolizes um, I think like I don't know if I, I don't know if you want to share about that but yeah, I will. fireflies is a, a, a symbol to the repatriation movement. Um, but, yeah. <laughs> I'll go next. Um, Every time I talk about the very first trip to, to Carlisle, I get so emotional. So the very first trip to Carlisle, I had no idea what boarding schools were. I didn't know they existed. Um, I didn't know the effects that they had on us um, back then. Even at Carlisle, I didn't really understand like why we were there. I didn't even know like until the day before that we were going. Because um, I remember the day before, I, we went to Hershey Park. And uh, I remember Sunrise saying, we're, we're doing this really fun thing because tomorrow, tomorrow's gonna be a really hard day. And I didn't really think anything of it until we got to the cemetery. It's like the whole time at Carlisle, we were um, touring Jim Thorpe uh, the gym that the children built. I didn't have any kind of emotions there. I didn't have any kind of emotions like touring it, but as soon as we came into the parking lot of the cemetery, you could just feel you could just feel all of the sadness that was there from the kids. And it wasn't until we were done at the cemetery that like I finally calmed down. And that was when um, 
I don't remember who sang this song. I know it was Chris. Um, Chris and Trey. And Trey that sang uh, a song for the kids. Um, after we left pieces of candy on the graves for the children. And as soon as we were done and heading to the bus, there were so many fireflies that came out. And we just kind of see that as something very powerful and very spiritual. And I remember, I remember thinking, I haven't seen fireflies in so long. And I caught one. And um, I took it on the bus with me. And Rachel was sitting next to me. And I was taking a video of a firefly um, turning its little light on and off. And uh, during that video, you could hear Rachel um, say, this is one of the spirits. And I, as soon as she said that, I was like, oh, I need to take him off the bus now. I need to put him outside. So I had him on my hand. And I stuck my hand out the window. And I was trying to get the little firefly off. And then I remember, I think Rachel was the one that said this, but she said, um, she said, bye, Cola, or bye, bye, friend. bye friend. And um, it finally like flew off my hand. And then um, I think during our research, we found out that one of the relatives that was at Carlisle, his name was uh, Cola. Friend Hall and Bear. Uh, Friend Hall and Bear, and that was what Rachel called the firefly in that video. And yeah. And I was also there um, when we brought the relatives back, and that time going into the gravesite, it wasn't at all like it was whenever I first went there. I wasn't emotional like I was. I was more relieved and happy. I also had my uh, oldest son with me that time. And um, it was really, it was really relieving to be there again and to not have that same feeling that I did whenever I first went there. Um, knowing that our, most of our relatives were gonna be coming home with us that time. And even on the way home, like Rachel said, we seen fireflies following our bus. Like they, you could just see them on the side of the road flashing. And it was also really amazing to see like the impact that we had from other tribes and seeing how much support we had when in the beginning we didn't have that much support, not even from mm -hmm. our own tribe. But yeah. I think uh, another really special moment was when we were pulling into Sinte, or Gleshka, the multi purpose building, and Saying almost seemed like the entire res was waiting for us, and waiting for them to pull up and to be carried inside, and just seeing how just the community community came together, um, and they came to to see the nine ancestors before we buried them. Um, It was really nice seeing all that, um, but I, I think um, throughout those six years, is that it kind of felt like we were by ourselves in a way. But yeah. Thank you. So this next question. I think you all have spoke, spoken to it already, but what I wanted, what you guys to do is to kind of share, you know, just thinking about and sharing about how much this has impacted you all. If you guys can just go one by one and mm -hmm. give us one word or one phrase to 
let the audience know how much it has impacted you. That's the first thing that comes to mind. Should we go down this way? Sure. Okay. Um, I guess if I could find one word on how it has impacted my life, I would just say like exponentially. I think just like more than I could have ever expected, hope, you know, everything that falls within that. I would say if I had to think of a word, I'd probably, I know it's like a, like a really traumatic topic, but I'd honestly have to say um, that I'm grateful for this experience and for what it's brought to me. Um, not only has it impacted my life so much, but it's also opened my eyes to, I guess, like, understanding more of like who I am and like, why some things are the way they are now and understanding more so like who my grandma is and the things that she's been through mm -hmm. and helping me understand like how to like help her heal mm -hmm. for the future generations i would say connection um connection to myself connection to uh, my family, connection to the community. Um, I thought that when I was younger, since I've been a part of Togala since I was 13, that I, I thought I was pretty connected. But um, going through those years of like learning about boarding schools and understanding it, the history and how that affects my family and you know pretty much all our other all our families. I, instead of being angry, because I think I had a lot of anger when I was younger. I think I had a lot of resentment toward my, my family in ways that I couldn't even un like comprehend because it was just internal. Um, learning about Carlisle and, and, and not just Carlisle, but like other things too, like the assimilation, the genocide. Um, I felt more connected to my people, understanding that like this is what happened to us and it's not our fault. It's not our fault why our people are hurting. It's not our fault why we have hardships. It's, you know, and it, it, we need more understanding people because when we have understanding people, we can, we can help heal the future generations. We can help heal ourselves also and be leaders for the future. Um, that's something that I, I, you know, that I found within myself is that connection, um, connection to culture, connection to language, um, connection to the land too. You know, I'm really grateful to be from Rosebud. I'm really grateful to have grown up here. And as much as I was younger, and I, I when I was younger, and I, I really hated being here. I, you know, I, I always talk to my inner child. I don't know if that makes sense, but I always talk to my inner child and, and, and try to, you know, like just, you know, because she had a lot of anger. She had a lot of resentment. She had, you know, and and if only I could turn back time and, you know, like, tell myself that it's okay and that, you know, that one day we'll figure it out, um, but, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think it's, like, a lot of, I think every interview that I've done, uh, talking about Carla, I always said, like, surreal. Like, I still can't believe, like, we did that. We had our experience in 2015, and we were able to bring back our relatives six years later, and it's already been almost two years, and it mm -hmm. still doesn't feel real, but it is, and I'm, I'm grateful for this experience, and grateful for everyone who's been a part of it. I've always been grateful for you and all of the staff that took us. Um, for putting it together for us and made it happen. Made it happen for us. Um, I have to say emotional 
because throughout the entire experience, it was very emotional, um, especially since I didn't get to go the first time. I was too young. Um, but And I think I was 17 whenever we brought them home, so I was still pretty young and it was all like new to me. I never really understood it until we got there. And um, I'm grateful that I got the opportunity to go. Um, yeah. <clears throat> um, I have many words that whenever I think about um, the journey to Carlisle, I just think of like bravery, healing, eye-opening, just because um, bravery, I know not a lot of people would even know where to start, mm -hmm. and um, it was very, I know it was very hard for us to start, mm -hmm. and healing um, is right in the middle of COVID whenever we did bring the um, kids home and it was healing me just because COVID took a lot for me just working in the healthcare field and everything experiencing all the things that were going on and then very eye-opening just to see um, all the support and love and everything that we got whenever we were bringing the children home. Just a question, Thank you. Um, I kind of want to add it on my part a little bit. Um, when I th thought of like the word exponential to describe things, it's just like, kind of like what Rachel was saying, you know, going from, you know, when going on a trip to DC, like a cross country trip for a leadership conference and not knowing, you know, what we we're gonna do afterwards and t it ending up being like a little kind of side quest, I guess you can call it, you know, on our way back and how it just like that one visit, you know, only took like what, two, three hours out of our day to like shift our thinking mm -hmm. and to shift our mindset into, like I said before, that unison aspect, you know, uniting together to for a common cause, for a big cause, especially for our people. And, you know, those initial thoughts going into the process of, you know, the repatriation efforts and, you know, actually seeing you know those efforts come into fruition mm -hmm. you know taking the trip to Carlisle doing the transfer ceremony and then coming back to you know the site where they were taken you know where we you know had the honoring in the ceremony there and I mean just seeing all of the people coming together uniting and I mean not just like our people you know everyone from the Ocheti Shakoi and like you know the tribes that we visited you know on our way back and it just like like what like I was saying, you know, exponential, like it brought together so many people that we would never have expected. You know, we thought it was just, you know, for the cause of our people, you know, our tribe and, you know, for it to carry over to all these other nations and, you know, seeing them <clears throat> trying to put their efforts and their actions in to go through the same thing we went through, to bring that healing, you know, to bring that, you know, unison aspect to uniting our community when once again and to be able to overcome the historical traumas you know one of the many things that we've had to experience mm -hmm. and to finally not necessarily get over that but saying you know you know it happened it is what it is you know what can we do to you know better prepare the future generations what can we do now to make their lives easier so they don't have to work as hard or they have to experience the barriers and the disparities that you know we experience today mm -hmm. Um, during that time, it kind of felt like we were Chetty Shakui again because we were coming home, you know, like all these tribes wanted to welcome the nine relatives in before we, on our way, uh, while we were on our way home. And seeing that this wasn't just a win for our people, but a win for literally all the nations, like this was something that like, that it was needed and is needed. Um, and. It was a reminder that all our tribes, all our people are hurting and that when we brought our relatives home, it really ignited this like this fire. Um, and we're really, I mean, just really grateful that, that we're still in, included in conversations now and still to this day, you know, for help or even for like, you know, like as a resource, like 
you know, what steps did it, would they retake so that they can do the same thing? Thank you. We just have a couple of questions left. This next question kind of reminds me of <clears throat> right before the peer-to-peer -peer consultation with the U.S. government, the Department of Defense. We all met in the lobby at the casino. I don't know if you all remember that. And we were just kind of talking about how the relatives that we were wanting to bring home did not have a voice. Mm -hmm. And you all became that voice. Mm -hmm. You know, and just kind of thinking about, you know, who, in our work with DCI, we, and I, I, I really hope that you all remember this too, because it was really art, we put a lot of effort in, in trying to instill in you all that. We always need at least one adult. You know, that youth need at least one adult that they can go to, one healthy adult. And so thinking about the relatives at Carlisle, you know, who did they have, who did they not have, you know? Mm -hmm. But here you all were, like 143, 40 so years later. Mm -hmm. um, you guys were there for them. So just in reflecting back to when it all started, or even now as young adults, who do you guys look up to as mentors? Who do you have? And in thinking about the younger audience that made you this documentary, um, I think it's important to acknowledge those mm -hmm. mentors in your life. Should we start out this way or that way? Can you go first, Carly? Mm -hmm. um, whenever we first started the Carlisle, one of the biggest mentors that I looked up to that always said that we were going to make this happen was Sunrise and Vicky, mm -hmm. just because they never stopped talking about it and was always there whenever we needed needed someone to talk about um yeah every time i think about tokala or jichangu youth council i think about the key and centers um, i always looked up to all of you just because i was the youngest oh, um, shucks. and like whenever we went to Carlisle, um, I got to hear a lot of you speak and it's just like powerful because a lot of you have brought me out of my shell too because I'm a quiet one. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I just always looked up to Vicky and Sunrise and Jess. Speaking, so. um, for me, I think a lot of my mentors were you guys, the ones that started this. Vicky, Sunrise, Tori, Marcella, um, mm -hmm. Micah, yeah. Micah. Shout out. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, my mentors would have to be um, DCI staff. Um, Vicky, I don't know if I should say like the full names, but. Vicky, Sunrise, Micah, Marcella, um, Jessica, um, even like within our own group of Tokala mentors and Sichang Youth Council members, we all like, I feel like we all like were each other mentors in a way because when someone would cry, then we'd like, you know, we, we would aid that person, support that person and like, you know, like that's how it was. Like it really felt like a family and I know um, we really, really relied on each other when we were in Carlisle too. Um, when it got heavy and it did get heavy, like, oh my gosh, it got, it got really emotional and we relied on each other. And we also prayed for each other too. And I think that's something that we learned just being a part of this movement is that prayer is so strong, so powerful. And, um, so my mentors were like my own peers. My mentors are staff from DCI, um, and Togala, like Jessica, and also um, the survivors. I got to talk with, have conversations with boarding school survivors um, to get on that level of like that emotional level too of like, you know, how hard, how deeply this impacted them because they experienced it firsthand. Um, having conversations and, and, you know, they weren't always like, like easy. They were hard conversations too, um, but, those are my mentors and I feel like if had I not reached out had I not like tried to connect with some of our survivors I don't think I would have even like 
like took this movement and took it into like you know like um I don't think I would have um like I guess like resonated with it on a deeper level than I you know that I do um so yeah <clears throat> I'd have to agree with Rachel um Vicky Jess um my grandmother, my mom, um, even you guys, and Sid and Chris. Um, throughout this journey, you guys have been like, I guess like, I would say you guys have been like, I guess like the younger ones, like me and Kelly, like are rocks, I guess, because I really didn't know much, but they've always made it like a comfortable conversation and always made me feel, um, they made it easy to learn mm. and um, never made me feel bad for asking questions or anything. So I guess just them and everyone else. Um, I mean, I can echo what everyone said, you know, Vicky, Jess, you know, everyone that, you know, has had like a consistent, you know, presence in my life, you know, I'm forever grateful for the experiences and the lessons that I've learned, you know, I can go on and on about, you know, my mom, my grandma, my aunties, you know, everyone in my family, and even those that extend out of it, I can, I mean, I can preach about, you know, how they taught me so many things, how they're able to, you know, get out of my shell, you know, being, you know, essentially making me who I am today, and I know it's not necessarily, you know, a mentor, but, you know, one thing that has always motivated me in that mentor aspect is, you know, being someone, you know, that I wish I had, you know, as, like when I was younger at some point in my life, you know, the times where I was asking myself, you know, the big questions and I didn't know exactly how to go about finding the answer, but, you know, I uh, I want to be able to like learn from those experiences so I can help, you know, the fu future youth, you know, future generations, you know, to, you know, overcome those issues that I've had because, you know, some of those things, you know, lead to, you know, internal abnormalities, whatever you want to call it, you know, you just don't want to bottle things up and, mm -hmm. I mean, my career right now is, you know, being a school counselor, so, you know, I take kind of a serious you note know, on that mental health aspect, just being able to prioritize me, you know, <coughs> letting, you know, letting in, letting me know that, you know, things are going to be okay, and, you know, not everything has to be perfect in the given moment, but, I mean, I have a tremendous respect for a lot of women, the older women in my life, you know, especially you, Vicky, even though you may not, I may not see you every day, but, you know, I have a tremendous respect for the women that go out and get it done. Cause I mean, growing up, I've witnessed, you know, a household full of women, you know, get it done, get it out of the way, doing what they have to do. And, you know, setting their priorities aside for me, you know, to have, you know, the happy childhood that I had, you know, along with my siblings. And I mean, it still carries over to this day, you know, I have a tremendous respect for, you know, you women right here and, you know, being able to, you know, voice your opinions your thoughts and you know being able to be there for the f you know for the youth and mm -hmm. I mean, I, like i said i can go on and on about it but yeah i'll mm -hmm. keep it at short and sweet <laughs> at that i also want to add um another huge mentor to not just me but like everyone in the room is um russell eagle bear and the tipo uh, office the tipo staff my own um peter um and even Marcita Eagleberry, she was a huge, huge mentor to me. Um, when I, when I, you know, like was kind of like, you know, is this? I guess when I had doubts and I had worries, I guess she would, um, you know, she would really guide me. And I really loved just being in the same room as her. I wish to be at least half the woman she is because um, she has a lot of wisdom. I feel like. A lot of um, fighting power mm -hmm. that I wish to have too. Thank you. I'll let her go now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so 
after, um, some of you kind of talked a little bit about this too, but after taking on, you know, the, this, this journey and all of the responsibilities and the, the challenges, the sacrifices that you all made, um, share a little bit about how you take care of yourself or what self-care looks like for you. Um, I don't know how a lot of you are familiar with vicarious trauma. And the definition of vicarious trauma is the emotional residue of exposure to traumatic stories and experiences of others through work, witnessing fear, pain, terror that others have experienced, which we all have. We all have experienced that, especially at young, such a young age. You know? mm -hmm. um, so how did you all take care of yourself? How do you do it now? Are you in popcorn or just going to go down? Or do we just... Popcorn? Uh, um, yeah, we can do popcorn. Everyone? Um, me, personally, I haven't really taken care of myself until just recently, like the last couple of years. And something that I do daily or try to do daily is um, having physical activity and that really helps um, with like my anxiety. Um, I also like being alone, um, mm -hmm. processing things by myself while listening to music because that's something that kind of takes me out of that space of like being um, worried or in that trauma response. Um, I like to go for drives and um, Play whatever song is makes me feel good at at the time. Um, I also enjoy being around family, just having uh, laughing, joking, being in a good environment, being around people that I love. Um, yeah. um, mine would be well. There was a time um, when I didn't have the privilege of going to an EP or um, going to sweat. Um, so what I used to do, because I used to live in Grass Mountain, was I would like go like um, walking in the the hills, and that would like bring me like bring myself back to like reality, because I tend to like leave I guess whenever I'm having a really hard time, and especially when I'm carrying like trauma from other I mean like when I feel a lot from from other people's experiences. Um, it was really hard for me to like do self care, do something because I kind of felt guilty. If that makes sense, like that, you know, I shouldn't be doing this because this wasn't my trauma, and that it'll just go away on its own. But um, recently, um, I became a um, a teacher aide for an immersion school, and I I found myself triggered when I first started because I made that connection where like oh, you know, I'm learning Lakota and I got to teach it to the kids and, you know, the children are speaking Lakota, everything's in Lakota, there's no, like, hardly any English and, you know, and I triggered myself because I made that, like, that connection of boarding school era, you know, now our ki our children can speak the language freely without getting no discipline, you know, there was, um, and, and, and they're learning it freely and they're doing it together and I get to be one of the adults doing that for them, teaching them that, and while well, I get to learn it as well. And I made that connection to that, you know, that boarding school era when the children couldn't and, and, and you know, like there was like just abuse, heavy, heavy abuse. And, and so I had no, like I, I, I instead of bottling it up because I kind of got like mm, sad, sad for my grandparents, sad for my great grandma who was heavily um like i guess i can't find the word for it but who went to um boarding school and was like she was um i can't find the word for it but she wasn't allowed to sp speak lakota so it wasn't allowed at home and so i'm like either i'm healing my inner child or i'm healing something and i know I, it's bothering me like I don't know what what's going on I'm just you know I and so I, I reached out to like um, for spiritual help for like and I and I was welcomed into the you know going to NIPI every week um, 
and that's where I was able to do self care and you know it don't it don't bother me anymore like it you know like it it does sometimes but it doesn't bother as me as much as it used to because I'm able to find a place where I can do like let it all out and be okay again I always surrounded myself with um, a lot of good people and um, I started being a youth camp counselor here for a lot of years. I just always enjoyed like working with the youth um, and then I moved to Mitchell and that was kind of scary because I was being on my own and um, I didn't know a lot of people so I started um, working at the Abbott House, which is a treatment center for young girls. And I'm a youth engagement specialist, so I get to like be a leader for those young girls. And especially for the native ones, they like kind of don't really know that I'm native until I tell them. So, it's, <laughs> um, you know, they feel comfortable with me and they always share their experiences. And, you know, they're always like surprised because I kind of went through the same thing and so um, they feel comfortable talking around me and I always feel um, I feel like good knowing that I could be that kind of person for them so <laughs> all right um well like I guess the year I was having leading up to you know the you know the of July 2021, like that school year was kind of rough for me. Um, it was my junior year of college and I was just going through like a horrible transition in my life. Well, at least mentally, I was going through a horrible, like a bad mental phase in my life. And I was having a real hard time actually coming to terms on how to prioritize me and my mental health and I mean my physical health at that. And I think this trip was like eye opening in terms of like, it made me more like emotionally like conscious like of being aware of my emotions and you know trying to figure out you know the deeper I guess the details into why I feel the way I feel or you know the way I think I do and you know after really that trip it kind of led me to take my physical health seriously so I relied on like you know weightlifting or DPP and stuff like that and now I like do it every single day like there's probably not a day I don't really do anything physically active you know play basketball lacrosse I mean whatever it may be it's just uh, being able to kind of like prioritize time for me during the day or during the week to get myself away from all the responsibilities you know the craziness of the world and you know of work and you know being able to compartmentalize you know work you know life at work is you know at work and you know life at home is for me it's my personal time it's the me time and I mean you know at that you know also being a mental health counselor you know I relied a lot on writing you know journaling and stuff it you know first it started you know writing my dreams down and trying to figure out you know where those feelings come from and then it just led to me kind of not necessarily every day but you know every other day or when I have an off day you know what was I thinking or you know what was I feeling you know what was going on you know where could those have feelings have come from and everything so it just led me to be more consciously aware of my emotions and I like to think now that I'm in a better place mentally and physically and emotionally than I was you know before even the Carlisle trip in uh, 2021 Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, just grateful for that experience and, you know, what it led me to, you know, after it. I guess I'll go next. Uh, I would say personally for me, um, like everyone I said here, being um, aware of their feelings. Uh, for a while, I didn't, I would disassociate a lot whenever I would think about, like, um, just like trauma or anything anything that had to do with emotions. And when I got pregnant with my son, it really opened my eyes to who I am as a person and what I want to be, not only for myself, but for him and for everyone around me. Um, being aware of 
energy, um, the energy that's around me, because we all take in each other's energy. So mm -hmm. just being more aware of that. And after that, it kind of got easier to got easier to think about things and what I wanted to do with my life and whatnot. And I also learned how to balance out my life better with work and school, being a full-time student, a new mother, and going to work at the same time was really overwhelming at first. Um, and it took me some time to get it under control. It's still, still working on it, but um, just understanding that it's okay and what I feel is valid. And I just wanna say that I'm proud of all of you. I feel like you guys have taught me so much over the years and your guys' resiliency and perseverance has shown me so much and it has taught me so much as a woman. And um, yeah, I'm just so proud of all of you guys. I'm glad I could help. <laughs> <laughs> um, for me, whenever we were down at Carlisle, we went to this library that we learned more about um, the children and everything. And I remember my grandma telling me that um, one of my great grandfathers did go to Carlisle and Chief Ruben Quick Bear. And after Carlisle, when we came back, it just made me want to learn more about him just because my grandma's getting older and she doesn't remember a lot of things and I was working in the medical field at the time and I just got so burnt out from COVID and everything that um, I took a step back so then I wanted to research um, for what he did for our reservation and that really motiva motivated me and how I do my self my self care is that I learned how to be. I learned how to be more creative. I created more relationships with my family, and that just brought me so much healing. Just because I haven't been taking care of myself before the Carlisle journey, but now I'm researching my family and learning all the things he did, but also creating, beating, and that's how I take care of myself. Mm -hmm. well, thank you. And just kind of thinking back to what Brooke said, I am so proud of all of you. I know that just hearing your guys' stories, knowing you guys, knowing what you've been doing, um, sticking in there, because this is a heavy, heavy mm -hmm. topic and a heavy journey to be on. But it's also, uplifting and refreshing and life changing so all of that goodness it just sort of balances out um, i'm really happy to know you guys are on top of the south care game because that that is there's a lot of vicarious trauma that we all picked up over mm -hmm. the past yes. seven eight years and so i'm really glad to know that you guys are taking care um, and that you're still willing to share your voice with this with you know, an audience through this documentation. I'm not quite sure what the next steps are going to be, um, but I really encourage you guys to stay connected and just be part of this last leg of this journey. Um, and I do know that, um, like, like you all know already, there's some other tribes that are that are doing this. There are still some Sichuan relatives there, and I know that you all, some of you all, have been part of that. Mm -hmm. You know we want to bring them back too, so I really encourage you guys to, to stay connected. But thank you all so much, and as we always do, we want to close this with a prayer. Um, if anybody is willing to say the prayer, that would really be nice. Who's next? Rachel. 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 Um, I never really prayed out loud before, but... Um, mm, nor did I ever close out a prayer. So, um, <laughs> I'll try my best, but um, I want to take the time to pray for everyone in this room for um, coming, 
coming here and taking the time out of their day. Um, a lot of some of us are mothers. Some of us are had just gotten off of work. Um, some of us may be even going to work. Um, and I want to pray for all the relatives that didn't make it in today that wanted to come. And I want to thank uh, our. I want to um, pray for all the elders who are going through this, um, going through their heart, their own hardships that they may not be, they may not speak about. Um, and I want to pray for um, everyone's journey back home. Um, and. I want to thank everyone for coming. I think I already said that, but... <laughs> um, <laughs> um, and I want to thank Lawrence for taking the time to set this all up for us. Mm -hmm. Really, really thankful because this is the first time we've ever sat down together and talked about it. And I want to thank Vicky for coming here. I know she has a long drive home, and I hope that, you know, her drive home is... Yeah, extra safe. safe. <laughs> <laughs> extra safe. Extra um, And I wanna, yeah. I mean, I don't know what else to thank me. The oh, the podcast. Thank you guys. I got a long drive too. Okay. Yeah, I have. They have all the way up Roosevelt Hill. <laughs> like um, uh, hope. And so I want to thank the dinosaur nation. Breaker, breaker. <laughs> Even before that, the Neanderthals. <laughs> <laughs> so we could go photo before the.